Welcome to a very special archived edition of People of the Free Gift Teaching Through the Bible. And that means it could range anywhere from current day to 10 years ago. And so this is People of the Free Gift, where we grab believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. And we're glad you joined us. And if you're new here, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and enable notifications so you won't miss any of our teachings through the Bible, which we release at least once a week and many times several times a week. And so we're so glad that you joined us. Well, over the last few weeks, we've been taking a look at the reasons why we believe in Jesus. And the reason why we've been doing that is because as we follow this story, as we have been doing since Advent of last year, starting with the birth of Jesus through his life and his ministry and his death and resurrection, the next thing that we find is it says that for 40 days, he walked and talked with his disciples, and it says he showed himself by many infallible proofs. So if we're going to walk along with Jesus and the disciples during these 40 days, I thought the most appropriate way would be for us to ask the question, why do we believe in Jesus as our Savior? Why do we put our trust in a book known as the Bible? What is special about it? What is unique about it? What is our faith grounded on? And we've been talking about, we started with Easter Sunday, and we talked about the fact that Christianity is a faith that is grounded in historical reality and truth. We talked about the reasons why we believe in the resurrection. What is the evidence that is there? Did it really happen? Is it a historical event or is it kind of wishful thinking that we want to believe that there's more than just this life? And then for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about Jesus as the fulfillment of prophecy. And we've taken a look at those prophecies that are statements and that are statements of fact. It's either going to happen or it's not going to happen. And how did Jesus measure up to those? And then we talked about a whole different type of prophecy last week. And that is the pictures that God painted through historical events and through his interaction with his individual followers and his corporate people, Israel. We looked at three beautiful paintings of the cross of Christ hundreds and in some cases thousands of years in advance of when it actually happened and for the next couple of weeks I wanted to ask a question that's on the mind of many unbelievers in relation to us but I wanted to ask it in relation to Jesus did Jesus live out the claims that he made about himself. Did he live out his teaching? If you were to ask the common person on the street who doesn't believe in Jesus why that is, they would probably, a majority of them, tell you that it's because they know Christians who don't live out their faith, who they say one thing with their lips, but then with their actions they do so many other things. They've heard about horror stories of things that really do happen in churches amongst Christians. And they name that as the reason. But in reality, the only response we can really give them is, yes, it's a shame that those types of things are happening. But take your eyes off of us for a second and put your eyes on Jesus. Because the real question isn't whether or not we're living out our faith, even though that is an important indicator to people of whether it's real or not. The real question is, who is Jesus? And did he really live out the claims that he made about himself? And so, let's start out with some of the claims that Jesus made. And this week, we're going to talk about some of the extraordinary claims that Jesus made about himself. And the first one of these that we find is in Luke chapter 4. It's in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and in fact, it hadn't really officially started yet. He was in a synagogue in his hometown, and he was asked to read from the scripture. 
And so he took the scroll and he opens it up and he happens to turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, a prophecy about the Messiah. And he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus closed the scroll, it said, and he happened to have stopped at a comma, by the way, or where we would naturally place a comma. The verse wasn't done yet. The next word is and. And so he closes it up, and he says, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He was proclaiming himself in that synagogue to be a fulfillment of that prophecy. And he was telling people, essentially announcing that his ministry would be marked by these things. Now these are very specific things. Preaching good news to the poor, proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind. Now that's an interesting one. You know, if you were to pick out one of these, that would be a specific marker that you could take a look at in his ministry. Did it happen? It would be that one. Let's go to another one. In John chapter 10, Jesus had just healed a blind man. And the religious leaders were getting on him about what he had just done. By what authority do you do these things? And in John chapter 10, it says the Jews, meaning the Jewish religious leaders, gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. And in this passage, Jesus was asked very plainly, Are you the Messiah? And he says, yes, I've already said that. But he says also, take a look at the miracles that God is doing through me. They are the things that will point to my identity. Again, he's pointing to his miracles. He's pointing to the miraculous things that God would do through him. And then in John chapter 8, a very intense controversy with the religious leaders. And at one point, Jesus says to them, Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was born, I am. Now, this is probably the most outrageous claim that Jesus could have made about himself. Here he was not just proclaiming himself to be the Messiah, the fulfillment of prophecy, but he was proclaiming himself to be the very voice of the burning bush that spoke to Moses. Those last two words, I am, are the same words that the voice out of the burning bush said to Moses when he asked, what is your name? And it's from this phrase that the Jewish people got the unpronounceable four-letter name of God. And they would not even dare speak it. And to this day, if you see a Hebrew person reading a Hebrew text of the Old Testament, they do not say Yahweh or Jehovah when they read over those texts. They either say Elohim, the generic word for God, or Adonai, which is Lord. They will not say this name. And anybody who did was in big trouble. And Jesus, in this text, and in several other places, got himself in big trouble with these guys. Because they knew what he was saying about himself. He was saying that he was not created he was saying that he indeed was the very God who created the universe. That he is self-existent. And they knew it. 
So those are some pretty outrageous claims that Jesus made about himself. And the question that's before us today is, is there any legitimacy? Is there anything that happened in Jesus' ministry and his life that would give any reason for us to believe that this is indeed who he was? Did he live out these claims? And that's where Matthew chapter 8 takes us. And so if you would turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. Because I, I believe that Matthew, as he was writing his gospel and putting together the account of the things that he saw Jesus do, I believe in this chapter, he is essentially trying to answer the question that we just asked. And he's going to show Jesus' power and authority over just about everything under the sun. And so if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 8, and we start out in verse 1. When he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anybody, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Here we have a very unique situation. It happened several times during Jesus' ministry, but you have a leper who is coming to Jesus. Now this is an out-of-the-ordinary experience as it was, just because lepers in the Old Testament were proclaimed unclean. Because they were, they were so contagious, God told them, put them outside of the camp until they were cured, and then they would, could come back. If they were to enter into the camp, they would have to shout out, unclean! And let people know so that they could get their distance away from them. These were the untouchables of society, the undesirables, the ones who were looked down upon, and almost as if God had cursed them and separated them as something different. In this man, he comes to Jesus and he says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, what is he saying about Jesus there? He's saying that I believe that you have authority to get rid of this disease. Now, Jesus hadn't gone to medical school. And there was no reason outside of who he was that would make this man believe that he could get rid of his leprosy. But Jesus looks at this man who obviously emotionally was more scarred than physically. To be a leper must have been a very isolated life. To feel rejected by the entire society. To feel unwelcome. And so Jesus, he doesn't just say, I'm willing to be clean. But notice what he does. He reaches out his hand and he touches this man. And when he touched him, I'm positive that tears ran down this man's face. Jesus didn't have to do that. And we'll see that very clearly in the next story. But Jesus heals this man of his leprosy, which is a very intense disease. And it would have been very obvious if he had the ability to do it or not. But when this man's leprosy immediately left, there was no doubt to anybody who was watching. Jesus just did a very amazing thing. So Matthew is saying he had authority over disease. But next, he says that Jesus had authority over time and space. He tells the story of another healing. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, 
a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And it says, when Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said, I have not found this kind of faith anywhere in Jerusalem, in Israel. And this centurion was saying something remarkable about Jesus. He was saying to Jesus, not even one of the people of faith, not even an Israelite, a Roman soldier, comes to him on behalf of his servant, no less, and says, this man is in bad shape, but you, you can help me. And Jesus says, all right, well, I'll come on over, and I'll, I believe you have faith. I will come over. And I will pray for this man. I will touch him. I will heal him. I will do what you are asking. And this centurion says, I don't even feel worthy that you would come into my house. But I understand authority. And I believe that just like I can say to one of my soldiers, go, and he goes, he has to follow orders, I believe in the same way that all you have to do is from the spot where you are standing, you can just say to that disease, leave, and it will leave. And Jesus, that's what made Jesus' mouth drop open. This man believed that Jesus didn't have to be in the same location. He didn't have to physically touch in order to heal He could just command it to happen, and it would come to pass. And Jesus says, it will happen just as you have believed. And that man's servant in the same hour was healed. And now we go down to verse 23. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now this is a pretty straightforward account about what Matthew is trying to say about Jesus. That with a word he could just calmly get up and say, be still. And the waves would die down, the storm would pass, and everything was completely calm. And the disciples now, are the ones with their mouths hanging open saying, who is this man? They'd seen him do some pretty amazing things, but this blew them away. Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now what would that say about Jesus? And then we pick it up. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, Two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, If you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this. 
including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Now, this is a story, it's pretty interesting. The, these servants, these slaves of these people, had demons living within them. And Jesus goes and he simply has to say to them, leave, go, get out. And the demons had to leave. They had to obey. And it's interesting that before that even happens, the demons say, identify Jesus and say, what do you want with this son of God? Are you here to judge us, essentially, before the appointed time? And they make a special request to be sent into a particular location, which he does, and then they run into the, they go into the pigs, and then the pigs go crazy and go off the cliff. But Jesus is said here to have authority over demons. Well, the disciples asked a very good question when they were on the boat with him. Who is this man? What kind of man is this? And we can already see the parallels between Jesus' claims about himself and what Matthew says he saw happen. He saw Jesus do these things. He was one of the ones with his mouth hanging open on that boat. Well, what, is exact, what exactly is Matthew telling us about Jesus? Isaiah tells us, The high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, the holy one says this, I live in that high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I refresh the humble and give new courage to those with repentant hearts. Notice it says, the one who inhabits eternity. Now, this is a hard concept for us to understand. And so to help us understand it, I've brought along some friends. Mr. and Mrs. Flat. Now, as you can see, they suffer from a very severe disability. And that disability is that they only exist in two dimensions which has certain limitations to it. As you can see, if I turn them this way, they disappear almost. They exist in only two dimensions. And I believe that we can learn a lot from Mr. and Mrs. Flat about how God interacts with us. They will have a lot to say to us about why it was that Jesus was able to do the things that he did in Matthew chapter 8. Well, you see, if we pretend that we are essentially the little G gods to Mr. and Mrs. Flat here this morning, we will learn about what it means for God to exist in a dimensionality or a lack of dimensionality that is far beyond what we enjoy. You see, Albert Einstein and modern physicists have finally caught up to the worldview that the Bible teaches. And that is that time and space are physical properties. They are created things. Just as the matter, the oceans, the earth, the animals, you and I are created being so is space and time. And before God said, there was no thing as these things. And that has some implications because if God is outside of time and outside of our realm of existence and outside of the limitations that we have, because essentially you and I are in relation to God, Mr. and Mrs. Flat, then it has some implications. And the first implication is this, that God is able to proclaim future events as if they've already happened because he's outside of the limitation of time. And if it helps you, 
You can picture a parade. And you can picture ourselves on the ground floor. And we're watching the floats go by, and it doesn't matter how good of a seat you have, you can only see a certain amount of floats going by at one time. But at most parades, they're covering it on TV, and so you have the Goodyear blimp or whatever else kind of uh, aircraft that's hovering over. And they're with the TV camera, and they can see all the floats at one time because they are above the realm of existence of the parade. They are not bound by being in a certain location. And the same thing is true of God. It was Albert Einstein who made this quote. He said, those of us who believe in physics know that the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. Because he realized that time and space were a creation. Well, the second thing that we realize is that God knows us better than we could ever possibly know ourselves. And why? Because he is our creator. He's our designer. Now, last night, I took some time and I put together Mr. and Mrs. Flat. And so I know more about them than they know about themselves. They may, for instance, not know that they're attached to a popsicle stick. But some of you in this room are more creative than I am. Some of you in this room, I would imagine, have created beautiful works of art, songs, or even machines. And I know of one of you in particular. And if somebody has a question about that machine, who are they going to come to? They're going to come to you. They're not going to ask the machine. And they're, if they're smart, they're not going to ask somebody else. They're going to come to you, if they can get to you, and ask you what's wrong with your machine. And Jeremiah tells us in the Old Testament that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. God knows us better than we could ever possibly know ourselves. And this was true of Jesus. In John chapter 2, it says, But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. We're told by Matthew that knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? That's perception. Well, next we find that God can get closer to us than we can ever get to each other. You see, I enjoy an extra dimension than Mr. and Mrs. Flat. And so what that means is that if they were trying to touch each other or get close to each other, they have a certain boundary in which they cannot get any closer. But I enjoy an extra dimension. And so I can get closer to them than they can get to each other. And Paul, when he's talking to the philosophers on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, he says, God did this, meaning he placed people where he would have them, so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And here's the amazing thing about what God enjoys, is that he can get closer to us than we can ever get to each other without us ever knowing 
that he is there. And the next thing that we find is that God is able, because he's outside of our existence, he can insert himself into our world. And once again, I find that in order to understand the most complex of ideas, we need the help of Dr. Seuss. And so let's see what Dr. Seuss has to say. I think that helps. <laughs> what the mayor of Whoville just experienced was an encounter in which his God, essentially, the one who is outside his realm of existence, the elephant Horton, showed him that he can interfere and have control over the existence that he knew. And he showed, he proved himself to Horton, or to the mayor, by covering up the little speck with the shade. And it went from dark to light, to dark to light. And later on, as Horton is trying to find a safe place for the speck, you find that there's some dew that drops on the ground, some frost. And the whole world of Whoville is covered in snow in the middle of summer and everybody's freaking out. At least the mayor is because he realizes what is going on. And the same thing is true for you and I. You see, when God interferes or gets involved, I should say, with our world, we experience some abnormalities. It's his way of telling us, I'm here. And when he inserts himself partially, you find it in the form of what we call miracles. You find things such as the storm calming down on the sea, 
a blind man being healed. Because there is power that is being manifested that is otherworldly, that is from the designer, that is from the God who is transcendent and who dwells in eternity. But God can also do something even more remarkable. And that is, he has the ability, if he so chooses, to insert himself completely into our existence. And we call that, when it did happen, the incarnation. It's the moment in which Jesus, the God of the universe, inserted himself into your shoes and in mine. And it says in John chapter 1, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. What John is telling us is that the very God who was never created who is self-existent, who is transcendent, who dwells in eternity, chose to insert himself into our world, bind himself by our limitations of space and time. And the other thing, the last thing that we're going to look at today is that God Because he is outside our realm of existence, he has a choice to reveal himself however he so chooses. And he can reveal himself as either one or three, however he so chooses. And so we find things like, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Which, by the way, that word one doesn't just mean there can only be one. For it says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And says that God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And then we find John again saying, that there is the Father who is God and the Son who is with God, but is also God. And then you add the Holy Spirit into that, and you have what we call the Trinity. And essentially what we are bound by in our world of existence is that we see God interfering, just like we saw back here, but... Sometimes it's one finger, and other times it's three. God can choose to reveal himself in our existence as he so chooses. But God is infinite. He is not bound by location. He is not bound by space or by time. He is not bound by any of the physical limitations that we are bound by. And so, because he is our creator, these are the things that he can enjoy as he interacts with us. But the amazing reality is that this God, who's completely transcendent, completely above our realm of existence, has chosen to insert himself into our world. And the reason why he did it was because, one, he wanted to make himself known. But more than that, because you and I have violated his holy law. And we call that sin. And because we have sinned, we owe a debt to God that is eternal, that is impossible that we would ever be able to pay back. But God came in our shoes to live this life as one of us so that he might die and pay the price for your sin and for mine. He 
The debt was eternal, and he made an eternal sacrifice. When he died on that cross, he paid for every sin of every individual who has ever lived on the face of this earth. And forgiveness of sins is available today to anybody simply for the asking. He's already paid the price completely in full. There's nothing you could do that could ever add to it. There's nothing else that could ever supplement it. He has paid the price completely and in full. And he has made it available simply for the asking. And all it requires is that you submit your life and your will to him. His desire is to have a relationship that's so intimate that he would actually come and dwell inside of us. And that he would live out this miraculous and all-powerful life through us.